When I grow up, I'm going to have an airplane. Wouldn't it be wonderful to fly just anywhere you might think of? Would you like to fly very, very much? Asked the cat. I certainly would. I'd do anything if I could fly. I would describe it as an adventure that a young boy goes on. He's advised by a stray cat. The adventure involves rescuing a baby dragon who is being held captive on the island. And the stray cat helps him pack up his bags so that he'll have all the proper equipment or, or presents for each of the wild animals he meets on the way to rescue the baby dragon. It has all the uh, trappings of a, of a hero story with a stranger and a quest. It was written uh, for the joy of story and not intended to be published initially. And I think you can really feel that come through the book. And I think that's why it's become such a beloved book uh, over time, because of that innocence, that sort of feeling when you're reading it that there's nothing overly calculated. You know, when a solution is needed, it appears. It was pretty early on when we were designing, um, you know, really focused on the design of the building itself, the interior of the building itself, and the, where the stair holes were going to be cut and, and that kind of stuff. And just thinking about exhibits that could be captured on a staircase, and it just immediately came to mind. I just knew that it was perfect for that space. Not only was it written kind of mid-century, it's a book that goes, takes you from, you know, a book that's representing more picture books to a floor that's going to be representing more kind of higher concept level books. Um, and as you go up, so kind of, it, it worked metaphorically, it worked historically. The challenge was to sort of like snake uh, um, that jungle uh, between the gap of the, of those circles, so so the so the exhibit itself actually has its own third radius. So it's kind of like if you look at it in a plan view, it's like three circles overlapping, all slightly offset from each other. Some digital files were made for what we call like the curtain wall, um, and that included the the foliage and the fauna mixed with placement for each animal so that they went in sequence with the book. So, you know, probably a couple hundred weird wood pieces popped off of the CNC and we had to start matching it to the background. Yeah, just a lot of pieces to keep track of and that, that was on Scribe and Jordan Dean and um, yeah, basically gave them a, a printed out puzzle for them to put together with all these generic plywood <laughs> leaves <laughs> and they found where they went. Much like the stuff that was done at the Reading Reptile and, you know, keeping in, you know, in the spirit of how all of this came about, you know, Debbie put her skills to, you know, making her, her paper mache magic. Um, but this stuff has to last a little bit longer. So that led to us, you know, like doing fiberglass techniques and, and other stuff to those animals so that they can have a harder shell on them. Um, a lot of people sanded. Um, different people added epoxy, you know, like little details and things like that that are hard to get in paper mache that bring the character out. All of those were passed along to me and then I figured out how to assign the right color to it and do the black stippling on it to try to give that graphite feel of the original illustrations. This is the image that we want, I think. Yeah, I think, I think anytime you bring something off a page into a three-dimensional space, um, there's a lot of question marks, there's a lot of, and there's bound to be a lot of disagreement, actually, about what that should look like and how it should perform. Um, I think with my father's dragon, um, yeah, we had issues about how big things should be, and particularly the dragon. It was a baby dragon, and somebody was trying to make it into an oversized dragon, which would not be able to capture the cuteness and necessity of trying to save him, because if it was so huge, he would have just broken the rope himself. So I knew that by, by projecting it and cutting it out. All right, I'm ready. And demonstrating 
to everybody the size of the dragon rather than looking at it in a digital way, they would um, immediately bow to my wishes. So the pinnacle of the piece is the dragon flying around the pole. And that was a, a big challenge, but really fun challenge uh, for Lee, our lead fabricator and, and designer to, you know, really look at something and say, okay, we need a flying dragon. How, do, how does this work? So we thought about a couple of possibilities uh, using a track, not unlike what they do in uh, dry cleaners. Long story short, it wasn't the best fit. So then we started thinking about possibly uh, doing more like an armature. We happen to have a large column in the center of this stairwell. So it's like, okay, well, we'll go off the column. But it, it proved difficult because the column doesn't move. Um, so we have to build everything to fit around the column. You know, Jordan did an, a great job. It was a combination of like using some of Debbie's techniques of doing large scale paper mache. How do we make sure the ins, you know, the inside of that that um, dragon is light? And how do the wings attach? And what kind of materials are we going to put on top of it? And every time we make a choice, it adds weight. 64, gain a few pounds. So we've got a dragon on one side, which would tip, would tip the carriage. So we put a cloud form on the other side. So, okay, now we've got them uh, supposedly balanced. Um, although in the manufacture of things, you know, it's like we're building a cloud. How much is a cloud weigh when it's made out of foam? Surprisingly a lot. <laughs> Holy cow. You take for granted how much several tubes of caulk. You know, we used caulk as like a, a textural element to tie some things together and you don't think how much, you know, six tubes of caulk weighs and then next thing you know, you're, you know, five pounds off. <laughs> 64 pounds, ready to fight. <laughs> the final installation is two stories up, so we didn't want to be playing around up there, so we built it, you know, five foot off the ground first time around. Then installing it on the actual, uh, in its final location, we had to drill out all the locations for the mounts and mount the collars. This is the first project that I think traveled through the series of hands that they've, you know, envisioned for the rabbit hole and how the, the creatives are all going to be working together. We got to work out, you know, like some of our process and, you know, in the middle of making that piece. It just is kind of like a symbol of the goal here where it it is detailed, it is, dense, it's colorful and lively. When I, I've given tours of the rabbit hole too, and I always use that as, because people who come here have to use their imaginations in order to really see like, what is this concrete warehouse gonna turn into? Um, and I just say, just picture that on every surface surrounding you. You want it to look like you're walking in a space that was made by people, but it delivers precisely what was created on the page. It's just a, it's an incredible thing. And when you see people respond to it, that's the thing that really makes me even happier because I know we're on the right track. See my little tear? Tearing up here at the rabbit hole. And it was really exciting to see it unfold because you carry something around in your head for a long time. And um, it never ends up precisely how it is in your head, but in often, and especially in this instance, it ended up better than what was inside my head, so that was really, really cool to see. My father was in a hurry to fly away, and when the dragon finally calmed down a bit, my father climbed up onto his back. All aboard, said the dragon, where shall we go? 